Hello. Hello. Um, I just want to start by saying thanks to the organizers for coming to the end of the conference. So um, the last couple of days have been amazing for me. Uh, just a complete revelation that a conference of this kind can exist. It's absolutely brilliant. Uh, I also want to thank Mary in particular, because uh, Mary, you spoke in Edinburgh uh, in 2014. I live in Edinburgh. Um, uh, and it was a really inspiring talk for me at a time when I was kind of struggling with becoming a, a, a leader and a manager for the first time. So I, I just wanted to thank you very much indeed for that. That's kind of why I'm here now, in part at least. So thanks to Mary. Give her a round of applause for that. So uh, uh, as Mary said, I'm a consultant and I, uh, my aim is to have help web uh, product teams to uh, take their UI engineering to the next level. Uh, and as part of my work with, with product teams, I've seen a common pattern, particularly in smaller teams that I'm going to talk about today. Um, so I've been told to start with a controversial premise. Um, it's always a good idea, uh, with, with, particularly with small talks. Uh, and mine is that I believe that single page apps damage businesses. Now, of course, like all controversial premises, uh, there are some caveats. <laughs> to take into consideration, this may not apply to you. You're probably all sitting there going, oh, ours is brilliant. What are you talking about? Um, and I personally, I love single page apps myself. Um, uh, but I have seen some businesses struggle with the single page apps that they've created. Uh, so we're going to look at that, why that might be uh, and what you can do about it um, in 10 minutes. So um, when we talk about single page apps, we often use Google Maps as, as the canonical example. It was one of the first, or if not the first. It's very rich, dynamic, amazing app. Uh, it's obviously got a long history. And because it's Google, it's got a big team behind it and lots of investment. Um, and we talk about single page apps in terms of their features. Uh, to give you a quick background, so uh, they provide this application-like experience. Um, and we do that by dynamically uh, changing portions of the page in place rather than going to the server and retrieving an entirely new page. Uh, in order to do this, we may access APIs to get new data and update data. Um, and we use client-side routing and history management uh, so that we can retain some of the web's best features, namely uh, deep linking and URLs and so on. And we do all this by bundling up static assets in JavaScript and CSS and delivering them to the browser, at which point the browser takes over, parses all that, and runs it as an application. So while we might talk about Google Maps a lot as a kind of canonical example, in reality, uh, a lot of single page apps particularly in the business realm, are a little bit more like this. So this is Buffer. Um, uh, was there someone from Buffer here? Hello. <laughs> um, uh, now, I'm not singling out Buffer here at all. Buffer is a great app. Um, but a lot of these kind of apps are crud. Now, that's not to say that they're terrible. They're not terrible. But that it involves kind of creating, reading, updating, and destroying data uh, with a nice UI over the top of that. So we have this kind of grand vision of our app when we start out on projects like this, that they end up something like this. So this nuclear bunker here has two floors underground of luxury accommodation. We have a private plane, an airstrip, so that we can fly in and out. And of course, uh, on the left there, your own personal missile silo. So you can take part in nuclear warfare yourself. That's very important. Um, in reality, for, for smaller teams, uh, it can feel a little bit more like this sometimes. It doesn't really fulfill that grand vision that we had. Uh, it's pretty hard to live with and uncomfortable. And despite it appearances on the outside, it's actually surprisingly expensive as well and resistant to change and improvement. So why does this happen? Um, I'm only going to give one example of why it happens. There are lots of reasons. But um, we need to kind of understand what makes it so hard to make a good single page app and why it's bad for business if we fail to do that. So. They're actually quite easy to make. So I imagine there are some people frowning out there as well. If you've ever picked up uh, a React beginner tutorial, uh, it's quite easy to make a to-do list, something like that. Um, but it's actually pretty hard to make them really good and to turn them into good products. And it's exceedingly hard to make those products uh, good, uh, provide good user experience, simple, fast, maintainable, and all those things that we expect from that vision. So I'm going to illustrate this with completely made up evidence uh, and anecdotal data, but in the form of a chart. So it has some, it has some, uh, uh, some face validity. Uh, it's a term from psychology. Um, so if you're to plot the effort that the, your team puts in to your app, which is really the complexity that you're adding to the system over time, 
against the user value that you, you're providing to users, um, and compare the single page app approach with more traditional apps, that, uh, like server rendered apps that you might get with something like Rails or PHP. Then early on, there's this, if there's this kind of good feeling that you're providing loads of value and that you've, taken the, you've made the right decision. But somewhere along the way, it gets, starts to get hard to add extra value. You kind of get constrained by the stuff you've already built. And uh, adding those new features seems to just make the thing worse. Uh, and you really need to push through that um, uh, to the point where you get that great user experience and performance that, that really rivals native desktop and mobile applications. Now, unfortunately, smaller product teams tend to stop somewhere along the way for various reasons. Um, it can be because you run out of money or the team gets moved on to other things. Like your product scope might be bigger than the team can, can actively support in a, in a very detailed way. Uh, and so what happens here is that you, you never really fulfill that vision and you end up kind of uh, uh, maintaining an application that's in that state of not being quite what you expected. So of course, as developers, we naturally blame the tools for this. And in the case of single page apps, that is the JavaScript application frameworks. So hands up, who recognizes all of these logos? Oh, that's pretty good. About a third of the audience, excellent. I'll buy uh, anyone a drink. <laughs> if you can recognize all of these ones as well. Um, I actually had to look some of these up, so there's no shame in any of that. Um, now, as developers, we focus a, a lot of the time on discussing the ins and outs of these things. It's quite entertaining and good fun. Uh, and that's fine. Like, this is developers exercising control over what we have control over. Um, and we need to make technology decisions, so it's important that we understand how, what these things can do. But if we take it to the extreme uh, and allow it to lead us too far, uh, we can get into trouble. So this is the Gartner hype cycle. Um, and this uh, plots the stages of technology visibility over time, essentially. So when a new technology emerges, uh, it reaches kind of, uh, if it's lucky, anyway, it reaches uh, a stage of hype. And then as more people apply it to more uh, kinds of problems, they realize it's not suitable for absolutely everything in the world. And then eventually over time, it, it comes out of that and, and reaches uh, this plateau of productivity, at which point everyone ignores it and it becomes boring technology like PHP, right? <laughs> so I wonder if a lot of teams get to this point in the cycle and start to look elsewhere. And <laughs> this is this is so this is kind of happening now with, with React and Vue to some extent. And a lot if you pay attention to this stuff on Twitter, it's basically endless. Um, but this has happened time and time again in the JavaScript community um, and, and you know outside the JavaScript community as well, but it seems to be much faster <laughs> in, in front end. Um, and of course, when we see this new technology emerge, we imagine that this time it will be completely different. And all our problems that we experience with our, with our current product uh, uh, will be resolved by simply by adopting a new framework. And of course, this is quite naive uh, and subject to bias. We heard some of this earlier. Um, and in extreme cases, you can end up in this situation. So this is what happens if you optimize for the developer experience exclusively. Uh, you're really just surfing that wave of, uh, of hype over and over again. And of course, this is pretty bad for business if you allow, to, uh, if you allow this to happen too much. Uh, because what you're doing here is, is really reinventing that user value that you've already created in your system, just using a different uh, technical approach. But then you're, the, and these things tend to stick around as well. It's not like you're completely replacing them. So you end up maintaining an awful lot of stuff uh, for the same user value. Uh, I only say this because I did this myself in a hypergrowth startup and fully admit to having done this uh, fairly naively um, in my early days as a, as a leader. Uh, so don't feel bad if this is you. So how do we break this cycle? Uh, and how do we maximize that user value without, uh, whilst minimizing the complexity and cost associated with it? So first of all, we have to remember, of course, that it's not the frameworks that are making the apps. They're just tools. Uh, it is, of course, our teams, uh, our, our team that make the app. Um, and so it's worthwhile taking some time to think about uh, how our team actually interacts and, and behaves with the product. Now, we've heard a lot about some of this stuff uh, this week, obviously. So I'm going to go through this very quickly. But um, things to consider, like do you have a clear understanding of the product vision? Are you all aligned on that? Uh, does your team have good communication practices and a psychologically safe environment for discussing disagreements and possible approaches? Does your team have the right combination of skills uh, and capabilities to execute on, on your approach that you've taken? 
And are you going about things in a sustainable way that will ensure the life of your product? And finally, do you actually understand what your product does? <laughs> now, this last one's quite surprising to many people, but if you've ever worked on a, on a, on a, on a long-lived product, you'll know that if there's been a bit of staff turnover, some of the documentation isn't all that great, the test coverage isn't that great, it's actually quite easy to forget what your product does in detail, that you miss a lot of the details, and you find you're constantly surprised at the little things that it does here and there. So earlier, Uberto talked about rewriting versus rejuvenating an app. Uh, I love that term, by the way. Um, uh, and I kind of like, like to look at this through the lens of lean software development principles, uh, in particular, the principle of amplifying learning. So for me, rewriting with a framework is deliberately forgetting learning that you've made along the way, uh, and then hopefully rediscovering uh, those as you rewrite it. By contrast, a rework or a rejuvenation requires you to learn about your product as you go along, which means it's much harder work, it takes longer, it's less painful, and it's less glamorous, uh, especially if you don't get to adopt that new framework straight away. But this is, in the long term, much more valuable, because it, your team has to learn about the implicit value in your product. So unfortunately, reworking a single-page app is pretty difficult, because up to now, we've kind of taken this monolithic approach to them, uh, it's only recently that tooling has been in place to allow uh, uh, breaking them up in, in a much more sensible way. So one thing you can do is to explore uh, possible ways of doing that. Um, and really, you want to break it down by user journey, if possible. Um, so that, and that means then you can, you can take the simplest approach that's appropriate for each part of the application and product. And then smaller apps make it easier to find and eliminate waste, both for your team and within the code base of the project itself. And of course, this is another lean principle. Um, and it involves taking regular small steps over time. It's not something you want to do all in one big go, but it's something you can, you can do over time. And really, you're kind of aiming for proven simplicity rather than some assumed level of, of uh, uh, future desired state. So you can use this question to ask yourself and your team uh, about what the, what the appropriate approach is. So what's the simplest way to sustainably add and maintain user value. And I think looking at it through this uh, approach is really vital for long-lived products in particular. Ultimately, the aim is to grow your team's ability to live with your product. It's a long-term relationship. And like all long-term relationships, it requires regular sustenance to keep it alive. Thank you. <laughs>